Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox and I'd like to welcome you to episode 280 of the FCPA Compliance Report. The FCPA Compliance Report is sponsored by the Red Flag Group. The Red Flag Group is a business advisory, information services, and technological firm that helps clients manage risk across four key risk areas. These risk areas include sales and sales channels, including distributors, resellers, and partners, suppliers, customers, and human capital. Human capital consisting of employees and contractors. You can find out more information at the Red Flag Group's website, which is found at www.redflaggroup.com. If you're attending the SCCE, Compliance and Ethics Institute in Chicago, I hope you will drop by the Red Flag Group booth and say hello and check out some of the incredible new technological products and services that the Red Flag Group has offered. I'll be there and I hope to see you there and at the SCCE 2016 Compliance and Ethics Institute. Today I have with me Rich Gergenti and Tim Headley. They are both with KPMG and they have written a very useful new book entitled The New Era of Regulatory Enforcement, A Comprehensive Guide for Raising the Bar to Manage Risk. In this book, they take a look at a wide variety of risk areas, including bribery and corruption, money laundering, economic trade and sanction, market manipulation, insider trading, financial reporting fraud, unfair deceptive uh, trade practices, offshore tax evasion, fraud and misconduct in healthcare, and fraud and misconduct in the life sciences. But I visit with them about their outlines of a framework for managing risk. Their outlines I found work across multiple uh, types of risks, and they work for really any type of compliance program. The episode comes in at uh, 25 minutes or so. I think you will find it quite interesting. I'm gonna link to the book in the show notes. And uh, also the uh, individuals uh, gave uh, their uh, email addresses if you want to follow up with them directly. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to thank you very much for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. Today, you are in for a real treat because I have Rich Gear, I hope I get this right, Gergenti and Tim Headley. They are both with uh, KPMG, and they have written a new book entitled The New Era of Regulatory Enforcement, A Comprehensive Guide for Raising the Bar to Manage Risk. Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be Good here. Morning. So uh, this book, uh, um, I read this book uh, over the past week, and it is just an excellent guide to a wide variety of regulatory enforcement and risks. Uh, as you know, I'm in the anti-corruption risk business, but it's much broader than that. So could I ask you guys, uh, what led you to write this book? Well, let me begin uh, that, and obviously Tim can, can add to it. Uh, I think this past week with the bombings in, in New York City and New Jersey, and with the celebration or the commemoration of the 9-11 uh, attack 15 years ago, uh, what we've seen over the past 15 years, uh, beginning with 9-11, with have been a series of landmark events that have led to a dizzying array of new laws and regulations. And in the case of 9-11, we saw the U.S. Patriot Act and the war on terrorist financing uh, that followed that. Uh, a lot of the anti-money laundering regulations and enforcement began uh, after 9-11. Uh, so in addition to the speed and volume of these new laws and regulation, we've also had the phenomenon of increased globalization, emerging nations, proliferation of digital data, and we've also seen more aggressive enforcement of uh, new tactics and more global in nature. And all of this uh, led Tim and I to say that there's so much that has happened over the last 15 years that we'd like to help our clients and others who are in the risk management business to connect the dots, to begin to understand uh, what has happened and what companies, our clients in particular, need to do in order to meet the challenges and to manage the risk that this new era has uh, created. Uh, we wanted to provide a more detailed framework uh, that uh, could be applied. Uh, there's a lot of different types of guidance that's out there from the sentencing guidelines to uh, what the different agencies have put out. We wanted to create a framework that would help uh, companies understand what they need to do, what are the various tasks and activities that they need to perform in order to be able to manage 
not only the risks that have emerged during the last 15 years through the series of events that have occurred, but also to manage uh, specific risks uh, that might emerge uh, in the future. And having that kind of compliance framework available to them and explaining how it might be applied uh, in general and also to specific risks, whether it's anti-bribery and corruption or anti-money laundering, we thought was an important uh, value that we could provide uh, to, to the readers. I mentioned 9-11 as being kind of a seminal of, but there have been others that have occurred over the last 15 years that have also changed the landscape. Uh, certainly right on the heels of 9-11, we saw the financial reporting crisis, uh, the Enron uh, situation, and what occurred after that is we saw Sarbanes-Oxley pass, which have obviously put in a new regime of governance for boards and C-suite uh, executives. Uh, with that came additional enforcement. Uh, we saw in 2004, 2005, and you've chronicled this quite uh, uh, in detail, uh, a, a renewed effort around anti-bribery and corruption, which I think had a lot to do with uh, the increased globalization and the emergence of developing countries, in particular the BRIC countries, where many companies were now doing business and created new risks. In 2008, 2009, we saw a financial recession, which was the deepest recession that uh, we had experienced since the Great Depression. And with that came uh, the Dodd-Frank uh, legislation and other relief measures that also created new laws, regulations, new enforcement powers for agencies such as the SEC and the Commodities Future Trade Commission, the creation of new agencies that had enforcement powers uh, like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And all during this period of time, we've seen uh, fines and penalties that companies have paid increase dramatically, uh, where at one time uh, they were tens of millions of dollars. Today we're seeing tens of billions of dollars in fines and penalties. All of this is a long way of saying that there was, we felt the need uh, to put on paper uh, something that people could read and, and a guide that they could go to to begin to help them manage what is occurring in this new era. Yeah, and Tom, I think Rich did an excellent job of um, explaining why we wrote the book, but one thing I think I would add to it, the book represents the conversations that we've been having with our clients over the last few years. And we thought it was an opportunity to put all of this thinking and in, in thinking the part of uh, our thinking, part of the KPMG, part of our clients in one place, be able to share it with a much broader audience. So, Tim, um, uh, Rich and I are both lawyers, and you are a certified public accountant and a certified fraud examiner. Um, so from that perspective, uh, could you start off and tell us why managing risk is so critical for the corporation today as opposed to uh, managing sales or manage, managing some other aspect of corporate governments, governance or life? Yeah, I think my perspective is a little bit different because I'm an, an accountant by training. I've been doing compliance and forensic accounting work for about 20 years. Uh, managing risk are, is actually, uh, these are the things that threaten the existence and the viability of an organization. Uh, I think that the compliance landscape has changed significantly over the, over the last few years and the risks are that much greater. Uh, as an accountant, you think in terms of controls, uh, we think about uh, preventing uh, misconduct. We think about uh, uh, detecting misconduct and responding to it. So I think it's vital that an organization have some sort of mechanism and think proactively about mitigating these risks if they want to maintain their economic viability in this market. Yeah, I think it was interesting that uh, both Tim and I, while we've worked together for, for many years now, uh, have different backgrounds and perspectives. And I think we've tried to put those two backgrounds and perspectives together. When I look at it from more of a, a lawyer's perspective, I see that there are innumerable laws, regulations, and rules out there, and companies are struggling to understand and comply with them. Uh, and we also see that those who are willing to invest in effective risk management and compliance can and sometimes avoid the consequences uh, of fines and penalties. They can, at the very least, mitigate the harm of the the inevitable misconduct or breaches that will occur within an organization. Uh, so lawyers who are representing clients who have issues 
uh, can you take advantage of an effective compliance program, a strong culture of integrity, to be able to argue uh, for uh, leniency, and the government has shown it in it recently that they're willing to listen to those arguments, and they have compliance counsel, as you know, in the Department of Justice, who's evaluating the effectiveness of compliance programs. So from a legal perspective, there's a lot to be gained uh, from taking the time and effort to invest in effective compliance. Yeah, and it's juxtaposed with that whole notion of economic viability. So I think that combination of backgrounds and skills have, have, have done well in, in moving forward our messaging. So I've often heard the phrase, the three lines of defense. Could uh, you all explain what, what that is or at least how it relates to compliance? Uh, sure. Um, I, this is Tim. I, I'll, I'll start and Rich, of course, jump in where you think uh, appropriate. Uh, in essence, the third line defense uh, uh, illustrates how the key parts of an organization, uh, whether it be the board of directors uh, to management, which in operations would represent the first line of defense, to the compliance function, which uh, constitutes the second line of defense, uh, and the, um, uh, the role of internal audit, which is the third line of defense, how they all work together to support in essence, a culture of integrity. Uh, the first line of defense, management operations, uh, they identify risks and put in place policies, programs, and controls to mitigate those risks. Uh, the second line of defense, the compliance function, designs and implements the compliance function itself. Uh, they advise management and the board. And importantly, they monitor the overall effectiveness of uh, an organization's compliance efforts. Uh, the third line, uh, internal audit, uh, provide a certain level of assurance as to the effectiveness of all of these compliance efforts. So the idea is that it's a construct that looks at all these major components of an organization, how they work to, together to support compliance. Uh, I mean, to simply state it, compliance is not and should not be viewed as a standalone function within an organization. All parts of the organization, whether it's part of the operations or what part of the strategy of an organization, need to be involved along with compliance and risk management to ensure that a company has the best organization it can to be able to uh, effectively deal with issues of integrity within their organization. Uh, you guys lay out several of the different roles uh, for the uh, corporations or excuse me disciplines within a corporation around compliance, but I'd like to specifically ask you what's the role of governance in risk management? Governance is what ties it all together. It ensures that there is a functioning infrastructure within the organization that supports accountabilities and provides for proper oversight. Without accountability and without independent and objective oversight, uh, you can't have an effective compliance program. And all of that begins with government. A governance, suppo a governance supports the proper functioning of the three lines of defense that Tim uh, laid out and, and ensures that those lines of defense are coordinated, working together, uh, that internal audit, whether it's compliance or whether it's management, are talking to each other, uh, that they're leveraging the systems that they have in order to perform their responsibilities. It ensures that risk and compliance function are properly resourced. Uh, one of the things that uh, governance helps determine is what are the resources, what are the tools that the compliance function needs to have, and an effective governance structure uh, will certainly support with proper resources and proper tools the compliance function. Um, I think uh, Rich laid out uh, a lot of all the building blocks of it. If I had to sum it up in kind of one um, thought, it would be it's the keystone uh, to make all these building blocks actually fit together with respect to compliance. So it's really more just tone. It's actually uh, not only talking the talk, but walking the walk. Yes, it's uh, it, it's more than just tone. We we talk a lot about tone at the top, what have you, and, and that's an integral part of it. But I think uh, if you look at some of the classic failures in history, uh, on paper the tone looked right, but the people didn't actually um, uh, walk the talk, so to speak, and that messaging was not believable. Governance is all about make, making that messaging believable. Yeah, I, I spent a lot of time to uh, chief compliance officers in, in major companies uh, around, around the, the country and, and, and globally as well. And this is one of their uh, important uh, discussion topics. You know, what is my response vis-a-vis -vis the board? Uh, how do I make sure that the board 
right information so that it can perform its function of oversight. How do I relate as a compliance officer to, uh, to management? Uh, what assistance and advice do I need to provide them? In determining the effectiveness of a compliance program, how do I work with internal audit? Uh, all of that, all of those questions are addressed uh, if the governance structure of a company is working as it should. And that's why it's not just simply a tone, it's really how the parts connect and who has responsibility and accountability for those parts. Well, Tim, you'll probably appreciate this. Uh, a couple of years ago, as I mentioned, I'm a lawyer, and a couple of years ago I discovered something called COSO. And when I read COSO, I thought, gosh, these are comp Compliance controls. This has nothing to do with financial controls. And I was explaining my revelation to a friend of mine at, at uh, PwC, and he said, if you're a lawyer and you can spell COSO, you go to the front of the line. <laughs> That's a, a long winded way of in, introducing one, my former ignorance, and two, my revelation as to why uh, controls are the absolute backbone of any compliance program. And you've got some, uh, some really interesting thoughts on here about. Uh, not only uh, the three types of controls, uh, de prevent, detect, and remediate, but could you explain the difference between detective controls as opposed to preventive controls and what the roles of detective controls are in an effective compliance program? Uh, sure. I, I, I'd be happy to do that. Um, any effective compliance risk management process is going to encompass uh, controls that have essentially three objectives. Uh, the first, prevent instances of misconduct uh, from occurring in the first place. Uh, second, detect instances of misconduct when they do occur, and unfortunately, no matter how good your compliance efforts are, uh, something some things can go and do go wrong. Uh, and then I would call the I guess a third pillar of it: uh, respond appropriately and take corrective actions when breakdowns occur. Uh, your preventative controls uh, include, I believe, first and foremost, risk assessments, understanding what the risk landscape looks like. Uh, preventive controls also include codes of conduct and related standards, and these are hugely important. And I think some find um, some find how important they are because this is where people learn to apply the right values to decision making, and is at the point of decision where integrity breakdowns take place. That includes uh, employing third-party due diligence. And Tom, from your other podcast, I know that's been in, an important uh, component of those podcasts and discussions. Uh, includes organization-wide uh, communications and training, not just some of the things I've, I've, I've heard on your other podcasts. It also includes process-level controls, because uh, the other things we've been talking about so far have been sent at the entity level, or process level, or are really down to where uh, the, it's transactional level type controls is another way of putting it. Uh, detective controls include your hotlines uh, and other whistleblower mechanisms. Uh, includes auditing, um, auditing and monitoring of compliance efforts and, and actual compliance with policies, programs, and controls. Uh, in the environment we're in now, another thing that we tried to address fairly deeply in the book was the notion of proactive data analytics and the use of analysis of big data. Uh, most importantly, in preventative, um, it is important that individual stakeholders, all stakeholders, understand this process or affirmative obligation to report wrongdoing. We talked earlier about the three lines of defense, but in some sense, and, I, and I've been doing this for 20 years now and Rich even longer, uh, surely your first line of defense are your own employees and stakeholders, and most of my investigations over those years have actually been derived from employee tips. Uh, finally, you have uh, uh, the response protocol or response controls which use in the form of protocols. You'll have investigative protocols. Uh, these will be protocols that are almost a schematic for how to think about investigations. I don't like to make those too prescriptive, but there are certain things that every organization think about when they are conducting an investigation, like triaging it, who will do the investigation, the resources, um, and, and things like that. We need to bring in other people into the process. Uh, includes enforcement and accountability protocols. Uh, Richard mentioned earlier holding people accountable with respect to uh, uh, appropriate governance, also enforcement protocols. I have to make sure that people are, are disciplined consistently and fairly and appropriately. I would need as part of response uh, disclosure protocols, and this is not just disclosure that you would find in your in your annual financial report in the foot in the notes, 
about whether or not they needed to or should think about disclosing uh, potential misconduct to uh, government regulatory bodies. And then finally, and, and, and maybe most of, uh, importantly, remediation protocols. Uh, many of my clients, unfortunately, don't give a whole lot of thought to these, but the idea is I have to remedy the harm caused. And I had to think about it. There were control breakdowns. I had to have a feedback loop that says, hey, I need to fix the uh, internal control infrastructure to make sure I don't have these problems in the future. So essentially, uh, Tom, that encompasses uh, uh, that world of prevention, uh, uh, detection, and response controls that you had been referring to. Well, I think Tim outlined it as well as it can be, but I'd like to not add to it, but just uh, point out two things that I think are really critical and that run across all of these, whether it's prevention, uh, detection, and response. One is the importance of, uh, of technology and data analytics as essential tools, whether it's prevention, detection, or response. Uh, organizations uh, have seen a uh, proliferation of their digital data. They've seen significant transition to digital content and records. Uh, their core systems in many instances are outdated and they need to be able to use uh, the tools that are available today all the way up from looking at uh, things that may have occurred in the past, which is sort of the traditional way to do things, to artificial intelligence, machine learning, cognitive learning, whatever you want to call it, uh, where they can begin to predict uh, the things that might go wrong within an organization. So there's a lot of work being done, uh, whether it's prevention, detection, and response to improve uh, the technology and data analytics around risk management and compliance. And let me just put a, a final uh, emphasis on the point around culture. Uh, there's a lot of talk about culture. It's kind of that soft thing that's out there. But the regulators are starting to look at culture with a much more uh, uh, specific eye. Uh, we've seen with FINRA, for example, that they've set out a standard uh, of what a culture means and is defined. Organizations are starting to benchmark themselves, whether through interviews, uh, whether it's uh, workshops, uh, whether it's through surveys, to begin to uh, assess their own culture and benchmark it against uh, their past and benchmark it against others in the industry. More and more, uh, the regulators are looking at what the culture of integrity is within an organization. That's whether they've gotten it right. Because even with all the controls in the world, all the proper controls, uh, if the culture of an organization isn't what it should be, uh, then that organization is going to be at higher risk than one that has a good culture. And then I guess finally what I'd like to say is that uh, this is to me more of an investment in not only high performance, but at high integrity, but also high performance. I think too often uh, or, uh, companies look at the compliance function as a cost, uh, when in fact it is a cost, but it's also an investment and it can improve uh, not only the integrity of the organization, but its performance as well. Yeah, I'm really glad you said that. Um, one of the things that st struck me or stuck with me rather over the years is I heard John Reed uh, formerly of uh, Citigroup, say something along the fo lines of the following, the reason you have brakes on a car is not to slow down. The reason you have brakes on a car is to go fast. And I tell um, business types that that's the reason you have an effective compliance program because it allows you, as you said, to have a high performance organization. So uh, that I really appreciate those comments. Um, Rich, let me ask, uh, at least start off with this one with you. You, you touched on the uh, government and what I'd call the FCPA pilot program, where they're giving credit for having compliance programs in place. But one of the elements is also doing remediation during the pendency of an investigation, certainly in my FCPA world. Uh, you, you all talk about a remediation protocol, and I don't think that's something that really has gotten as much play as uh, some of the other protocols. So could you explain what that is and how a compliance officer or legal department or a company could use a remediation protocol? Yeah, I, I think this has uh, been a, a little bit more of the currency of today where not only are uh, the agencies like the Department of Justice and SEC looking at internal controls, but they're looking, even during the pendency of an investigation, for what the company is doing to identify the problem or the breakdown that occurred that led to whatever misconduct. And it's, you know, it could be 
you know, as, as you and I have just talked about, uh, something in the area of, of an FCPA violation, but also other forms of misconduct. We've seen it, uh, whether it's uh, the LIBOR investigation or other uh, investigations of, of misconduct within an organization. Uh, the government wants to know uh, that you've identified the problem, that you've uh, cooperated uh, with the government. They also want to know that you're prepared to disclose and they also want to know that you are taking measures to fix the problem. Many of these investigations on the part of the government take years. Uh, and they want to know that the compliance uh, function is looking not only at the internal controls, but any weaknesses in the compliance program, whether it's weaknesses as a result of uh, re lack of resources, uh, whether it's weaknesses because their risks assessments have not addressed uh, the issues that really have created the problem, whatever it is, uh, they want to know that remediation efforts are going on and those remediation efforts will be tested for their effectiveness uh, and that puts a company in a much better position when there's an enforcement action to be able to uh, argue for and ultimately get uh, some level of leniency where the misconduct has occurred. Yeah, I, I agree with that with respect to response. I think the expectation today is that the remediation is going to be real time rather than wait until all the dust clears and you understand everything that took place as you move along through that investigative process that Rich was mentioning that you are uh, performing the remediation in real time and not waiting until out completely after the fact you understand all, all the facts and circumstances move completely through the disposition of the investigation but during that process you are remediating. Well, with the, uh, certainly in the FCPA world with the pilot program, they have uh, made clear that uh, extensive remediation uh, is one of the key factors that the DOJ will look at in terms of uh, giving a uh, reduction of a fine penalty or even a declination. So it's something that companies really need to think through having it in place, both, as you said, uh, Tim, the remediation controls, but also, as you talk about, Rich, the remediation protocol. So, gentlemen, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time, but I was wondering if uh, any of our listeners wanted to uh, reach out to you, uh, could they do so? Uh, and if so, could they email you? And how would they do it? The best way would be through email. Uh, my email address is pretty simple. It's rgergenti, G-I-R-G-E-N-T-I, at kpmg.com. And uh, I will do my best to respond in a very timely fashion if there are any inquiries. Tim? And, yeah, no, same for me. Uh, email is always best. And the email is T Headley, T H E D L E Y, also at kpmg.com. And Rich and Tim are the authors of The New Era of Regulatory Enforcement, a comprehensive guide for raising a bar to manage risk. And as I said, I will link to this uh, book in the show notes. I heartily recommend it. It would be a great addition for a, a general counsel, a compliance officer, a compliance practitioner or anyone else who wants to understand not only the specific regulatory enforcements that we are facing in business today, but a way to think through or, or put a framework in place. So gentlemen, I'd like to thank you very much uh, for taking the time to visit with me today. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate the thank opportunity you. to be here. Well, this is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. I have two calls to action for you. If I could, if you have listened to this podcast on iTunes, or on YouTube, I would greatly appreciate it if you would go to the comments and leave us a comment and or rate this podcast. Also, I'm developing my next list of questions for my mailbag episode. So if you have any questions, uh, please shoot them to me in an email. This is Tom Fox. I'd like to thank you very much for listening to the FCPA Compliance Report.